Okay, so here's my, um, this is SIGWIN for anyone who has a, yeah, there's a couple of PCs. Do you, do you guys install SIGWIN to get iMod? Yeah, okay. This is just a, a Windows terminal program. So to launch uh, iMod, so iMod's a, um, just to give a bit of introduction as to what iMod is, iMod was developed by the University of Colorado Boulder. Um, I believe the original paper was published in 1996, so it's, it's pretty, it's been around for a long time. It's kind of been the standard in the EM community for this type of analysis for, for decades. Um, so a lot of what we're, we've built to do this automated work is sort of built around leveraging iMod a, as much as possible to not have to repeat tasks. Um, iMod's a suite of, of different programs. Uh, 3D Mod, which I'll be introducing you to here, is the graphical interface for actually looking at data, playing through it, and manually segmenting it. In addition, there's a number of command line programs, uh, at least five to ten of which we'll be using throughout the demo session today. Um, and we'll introduce those as we get to them. So just to start with the 3D mod uh, GUI, um, it's called just by typing 3D mod and hitting enter. What you'll see once you do that is this interface, um, most of which is almost never really important for the type of analysis we're doing here. I'll introduce you to the, to the main things that are. The first is your image file here. So in this field, this is where you'll select your, your stack of EM data. So for iMod and in the demo sessions that we'll, you'll be downloading the data for, the uh, EM data is stored in a format called MRC. Um, this is just a, uh, an image format that's used specifically for um, microscopy data that allows us to save a three-dimensional stack of images into one file. So I'm just going to click Select here and then find a data set that I'll use as an example. So you can see here this um, .mrc file. This is coincidentally the same one that I've shown throughout the whole <laughs> uh, first lecture. Model file will also be important. So what model file is, is the file that's going to have the segmentations that we'll be generating. Um, right now we don't have one because we're just opening the image from scratch. But later on, once you have one, you can select it here under your model file and it'll load concurrently on top of the data. The other thing that's very important, especially if you're working on a laptop, is this cache. So by default, iMod will try to load the entire uh, MRC stack into the memory of your machine. Um, this data set I've shown here, this is the one that was about one to two terabytes in full resolution. So obviously that's, that's never going to work. It'll just cause your computer to crash. And it will still try to load the whole thing. <laughs> so that's not good. This one here is downsampled. Um, to isotropic resolution, which means it's, as, as, if you recall from before, it was 4 nanometers per pixel in XY and 30 in Z. So XY is downsampled to 30 nanometers, so it's 30 by 30 by 30. Um, so even at this downsampled resolution, the whole stack, I think, is still 16 gigabytes, um, which does not fit into memory on my machine. <laughs> so I'm going to use this cache you can set a number of sections that will just load into memory. So here, if I put one, it'll just load one section into memory at a time. And then as I scroll through the data set, it just has to load each new section. So it's slower, but it allows us to actually perform this analysis on a, on a, um, a not super powerful machine. Yeah. Okay, yeah, of course. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, so really those are the only, I mean, those, those are the three sort of entries we'll focus on right now. Those are just basically uh, to get us going. So I'll hit OK, and it will load really quickly because I just loaded that one uh, slice into memory. So um, what we see... Here, you'll have two windows. On the left is the, what, if I didn't minimize them, we'd have two. On the left is what I call the 3D mod window, and on the right is the zap window, uh, which is what displays your actual image. Um, 
basic controls, the first thing you'll want to do, and there's a, a PDF uh, kind of walking you through this step by step again. So when we get to the demo, um, you, you'll know what to do. You don't have to necessarily write everything down. Um, the first thing you want to do when you open iMod for the first time or 3D mod is set your mouse options, which is under edit options, mouse. Um, again, the reason we have the three button mice is that it's very, very, very advantageous for segmentation purposes to be using a mouse. It's possible to use a trackpad on a laptop, but it's, it's going to be very um, slow and messy. Um, so when using a three button mouse, this uh, right, left, middle, the one with two stars, is really going to be the optimal configuration for you. Uh, I highly suggest everyone switch to that. And once you've done that the first time, it'll be saved. Uh, you shouldn't have to change it ever again on, on that machine. So we'll click Done. Mine was already set there. Um, iMod has two modes here, as you can see on the 3D mod window, Movie and Model. Movie is really just for playing through. So if you if you had a stack of images or you had a segmentation you wanted to show someone, um, if I right button click or my on my wheel right right mouse button click, it'll it'll just play through that that stack of images in a, in a movie mode, and it will show the segmentations we've generated. So this is it's a good visualization tool, but it's not really what we use for um, actually doing any work. So again, I just right-click again to stop that. Um, model mode is what we use to perform the actual segmentations. So 99% uh, of the time, you're going to want to be in model mode. So it's always a good idea. If something's behaving not the way you expect it to do, it's probably because you're not in model mode. Um, so that's that. Um, the black and white sliders here are to adjust the contrast. Um, if you click both these float and sub area buttons and hit auto, it'll give you an auto contrast that's usually pretty good. Um, and, but depending on your preferences, some people like it a little darker, some people like it a little lighter. You can adjust it however you like using those sliders. Um, basic navigation. Uh, if you've set the mouse as I suggest, um, a right click and drag will pan around the image. like so. Um, plus and minus will zoom in and out, the plus and minus keys. Uh, you can also see that reflected by this value here, uh, 0.75, so we're at 0.75 zoom. If I hit plus, we're at 1, 1 1.5, etc. Um, the numbers here correspond to the, the size of the image stack, so about 4K by 3.1K by about 1,300 slices. Um, if I right click somewhere on the image, you might, maybe you can make out there's a little yellow crosshair here. That's that selected pixel. And then the, uh, that coordinate there in XYZ will be reflected in where I just click. Um, to play up and down through the stack of images, uh, on Windows at least, it's going to be page up and page down. So here I'm just hitting page up repeatedly. You can see the slice number that we're on reflected by this value here as well as over here. Um, so that's one way of doing it, using the page up and page down. On Macs, it's, it varies. It's usually some combination of function or Apple and up or down instead of page up and page down. But um, we'll all figure that out individually when we get there. Um, another thing. Another way to navigate throughout the volume is just to use this slider bar here. Um, the insert button will take you to the middle. So if I just hit insert on my keyboard, it takes me right to the middle. Um, same with home and end. Home and end take me to the, the first and last slices, uh, respectively. So just some sort of quick navigational tools. Um, an iMod model file, which is, again, what we loaded in that second um, selection box through the initial uh, graphical interface sort of has a hierarchy going from that's represented in descending order here model to object to contour to point 
So a model file can consist of a number of objects. An object is typically one three-dimensional structure. So one mitochondrion, one nucleus, etc. If we had 10 mitochondria that we wanted to segment in their entirety, we'd have 10 objects. Just one three-dimensionally enclosed object is, is one object. That will consist of a number of contours. The contours, if you recall back to the lecture, were just basically traces around the perimeter of the structure in two dimensions. So if we have one mitochondrion that's 10 slices, that persists on 10 slices throughout the stack, we'd have 10 contours, and those 10 contours would belong to one object. And each of those contours, as saved to disk, consists of a number of points. So what you'll see rendered in the interface is a nice smooth contour that's made by interpolating about a series of points. So what's saved to the actual disk are just those points in that contour. Um, any questions on the basics so far? Okay. So now I'll show you how to actually perform the segmentation. Um, we go to the, the, the best way to do this, again, when you start iMod and you're going to be tracing, you're always going to want to open what are called your drawing tools. So there are a number of plugins that, that others have developed for iMod. They're all located under this special menu here. Um, the ones that we're going to walk through today are interpolator, which I'll get to later, and drawing tools. So right now, for now, I'll open drawing tools. The first time you open it, you might get a little friendly message from uh, an Australian fellow named Andrew Noski, who was an old postdoc with us who developed the drawing tools. Um, on there, there will be some, and I think I included it in the documentation that you can download from the BBDTC. There's some YouTube videos that essentially walk you through what I'm describing now. So if you, you need to do this again in the future and you need a refresher, those videos are a pretty good source of, of information for that. So the drawing tools. Um, there's a number of drawing tools. These are basically just like uh, Photoshop basic tools that you would picture. There's, a, there's a, a, a sculptor for fixing contours that you've drawn. There's some tools for making contours better for, um, that I'll introduce you to. The, the, the most popular of which is Curve. Um, Livewire is uh, sort of used for tracing membranes, so it'll do some sort of prediction as to where the membrane is, which might make your segmentation faster. Eraser is pretty self-explanatory. Measure is also pretty self-explanatory. Um, the first time you open your drawing tools, it won't look exactly like this. They'll, these tools will be in different orders. Um, you can change them by Clicking, it's a kind of a hidden trick. All of these buttons here are clickable, so you can click on any of them. And then you can customize your tools. So using these drop-down menus, you can select the tools you want. Um, the ones that I have selected here, normal curve, join, live wire, warp, and eraser, are the ones that I only ones I've used, and I've been doing this for a long time now. These are I, the, my recommendation as to the best ones to set, um, you're also going to want to set them in some sort of logical pattern for you because these numbers here that you see to the side of each tool are hotkeyed to the numbers on your keyboard. So as you get proficient with uh, doing this sort of segmentation, instead of having to go back and click on these radio buttons, you can just um, use the hotkeys to get around. And, um, you'll very quickly memorize those. So getting into uh, just the use of each tool, um, I'll find something to trace, preferably something somewhat complicated. So here again, I'm just right clicking and dragging to pan around the image. Um, we'll go with this nucleus here. So this is a nucleus. Um, Again, just kind of highlighting what everything is in the image. These are all individual mitochondria. Uh, we can tell that they're mitochondria because they're, they have a, a thick uh, double membrane around them and this sort of striated pattern you see here of Christie. Um, the nucleus is, is obviously one of the easiest things to detect. Again, a big uh, dark double membrane around it and it has this sort of 
um, speckled pattern uh, in the middle from uh, chromatin. So to trace the nucleus, um, one way of doing this would be to use the normal tool. So the normal tool is the worst tool to use, but I'm going to demonstrate its use anyways because seeing me fail using it will um, really drive home the point of why you want to use the other tools. So the, the normal tool is just a simple uh, tracing like in a coloring book. So I'm just going to hold down my left mouse button and um, trace around it. And I'm doing a pretty quick and poor job here because the normal tool is terrible. So as I get close to where I started, you can see by those two points there, if I now right click off, it closes um, the, the contour based on those start and end points. Um, it's doing that because the object type is set to closed. Uh, you can change it. So if I go to Edit Object Type, this is sort of the um, properties, for lack of a better term, of this object. Um, we can see a number of things we can set here. Object name, that can be useful if you know I could call this nucleus. Or if I was tracing a bunch of different nuclei, I could call it nucleus 1, nucleus 2, etc. That These are things that when you run the IMOD command line programs in the future, It'll spit these things out, spit out the name in addition to some of the metrics, so you'll know what they belong to. Object type, again, closed is selected here. Closed is the default, and that, again, is that behavior where it, it makes a closed contour between the first and last points. Open is the exact opposite of that. It won't um, close those points. So if you see after I change it to open, it's now created just a sort of line rather than a closed contour. Um, obviously, that's, you wouldn't really want to do that for a nucleus or a mitochondria or something that's an enclosed structure, but maybe for this ER out here, something that's just a linear strand, if I use open for that, that's really what I want. I don't want it to, to close the beginning and end and, and make some sort of contour. Scattered, um, well, I made it all disappear. So scattered is just replacing single points around. Um, this, I don't think we're actually going to use scattered today. This is usually just used for placing, say if you wanted to place a sphere, if you were segmenting vesicles or something that were all about the same size, you could place a scattered point at each one and make its radius a certain size to, to make an easy sphere. Or sometimes I use them for just placeholders. If I see something interesting and want to come back to it, I'll just place a scattered point there, and, and then I can easily get back to it. So I'll change it back to closed for now. Um, Another thing that can be helpful is line width. That just makes the contours bigger in case you have trouble seeing them. I usually do this because one is pretty skinny. Um, two or three is usually a good thing to set it at. Um, what else? You can fill them in. Again, this is usually for visualization purposes, making a, a, a figure um, with a transparency. Um, Again, as I mentioned before, the contour is composed of a set of points. It's not actually a, a smooth line as it's saved to disk. So to visualize that, I can just choose symbols circle here. And you can see if I zoom in now, that shows a circle on every point placed here. So the, the, the line you're seeing here is just some sort of linear interpolation across all these points. That just makes it easier for, for tracing purposes. But what's saved to disk is actually the x, y, z coordinates of each of these points. Um, those are the main things you'll, you'll want to be changing. You'll be changing throughout the day in this Edit Object Types menu. You can also change the color. Again, Edit Object Color um, just gives you RGB sliders that, that will change the color of your object. Um, now I'm going to use, so, so getting back to the normal tool. Uh, the normal tool is limited in its use because it's, it's not very accurate. Uh, you, you can see there, it's very slow. I have to make everything pretty perfect the first time. So I'm almost never going to use the normal tool. Um, the curve tool is going to be a better tool to use, which I'll introduce next. Um, first, I want to get rid of these contours. 
So there's a number of ways to do that. First and probably most obvious to everyone is this eraser tool. So if I select that, you'll see my mouse crosshair now has a red circle around it, and I can increase or decrease its radius using my scroll wheel on my mouse. Um, if I left click somewhere, it'll delete everything underneath it. And um, you can control Z to undo um, on Apple. I imagine it's Apple Z or Function Z or something like that. Um, so that's one way to get rid of a lot of objects all at once. You can make this wheel really big and just click, and then they're all gone. Uh, obviously, you can make it smaller just to delete one. The other option is to um, select that contour. So you'll notice here I have two contours in my 3D mod window, and I can cycle between them. And as I cycle between them, they're kind of selected by having these, these dots on them, these yellow dots. I can also achieve that by just right-clicking on it. That's one in object, contour one and contour two. So while it's selected by right-clicking on it, I can go edit contour delete to get rid of it. Um, a nice thing about this 3D mod window is that every thing that has a hotkey will show you it when you go to the menu. So if you notice when I go edit contour delete, it says shift D next to it. So sometimes that's a lot faster than even using the eraser tool. If I just right click on it and hit shift D and it's gone. And I'll do the same over here. Um, any questions so far? Okay. So now uh, curve tool. Um, curve is similar to normal, except uh, better. <laughs> so what I'll do is anywhere on the structure I want to trace, I just left click once on it. And you'll see now I have this red line that drags out from it. And now I can just click around the perimeter of my object, and it'll build these smooth interpolations between adjacent points. So this helps me be um, a lot more precise. And it helps with some of the post-processing or uh, warping and smoothing I'll have to do afterwards. Again, I'm going to do a kind of a poor job just to sh so I can demonstrate the other tools. So you see there, I, I kind of messed up. But in general, if I had been trying to be precise, it would be a, a much easier way to do it than using uh, normal. Um, the warp tool is my preferred tool for correcting the contour once you've made it. Uh, sculpt, which I don't have here, I'll put it there just to show you the differences between them. They achieve the same goals, they're just a little different, and it's probably, depending on what you prefer, is going to be what you want to go for. Warp, again similar to Eraser, uh, has this red circle around my mouse cursor, and I can control its radius with the wheel. As I hover it over a section of the contour, you see it turns red. That's the section of the contour that's going to be affected as I warp. So warping, I'm just going to left click and drag, and it, and it nudges that sort of arc of the contour in. So I can make my wheel smaller and just nudge in particular regions. And this is a good way to fix your trace once it's been done. Again, I'm just trying to get on that membrane. So that's, that's, that's pretty good. That's good enough for these purposes. Yeah. 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 Um, it, it, it depends on, on what you're tracing. <laughs> um, for, for nuclei like this that, are, that, that can be very complicated, that have a lot of folds in them, it, it, it usually makes sense to try to be pretty accurate first. Um, for some of the simpler things like mitochondria, where you can usually fix them just by one warp tool use, you can usually be sloppier. Um, and that's something that you kind of just learn from practice, honestly. Um, the other thing is a sculpt tool that performs the same thing, except instead of hovering over the contour, you're just going to basically click up to it. So here I'm left clicking and dragging, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to push in that way in a, in a size the same size as the, as the wheel. 
the masses. Okay. Whoa. Good thing we can control. Oh, change in a way that prevents envy. That's great. Okay. Well, we'll get rid of it. Um, okay. So those are the those are the basic tools. Curve is most useful for these sort of really um, heterogeneous structures like nuclei. Um, join going down the list. Join obviously joins two objects together, or, or it can also, in reverse, split them apart. Um, join is also my preferred way for segmenting mitochondria. So as we move forward in the demo, you'll be doing this a lot, and this is the way I recommend doing it. Um, join tool will, if I just left click, it'll make a circle the same size as the radius of my red circle here. If I left click and drag, it'll make a sort of contour that's the same radius as that circle. So we can use that to our advantage when we're tracing things that are circular or ellipsoidal, like mitochondria. So I can just really quickly segment these guys out using that join tool. And that's very powerful. It's much faster than using the curve tool to trace around. Um, of course, the, the true purpose and why it's named the join tool is it can join contours together. So if we wanted to join these together, if these were actually meant to be part of the same contour, I can left click and drag across them. And you see there they merge into one. Um, conversely, if I want to split them, which in this case I do, if I um, middle click and drag, it'll split them. And then I can use um, warp again to, to fix those. Um, any questions? Those are the basic drawing tools that we'll be using throughout the rest of the day. Okay, we have a couple of minutes. So in the next couple of minutes uh, before our break, I just want to introduce you to actually making three-dimensional structures. So now we've just focused on two-dimensional, making two-dimensional contours. How do we build a three-dimensional model from this? So I'll just use this mitochondrion here as an example. Um, this is where the other tool I mentioned at the outset comes in handy, called the interpolator. Again, under the special plugins menu, special interpolator. Um, this has a number of options. Uh, most of the time, you won't even need to change them. The defaults are, are, are pretty much good for anything we're going to do. So just to get the functionality of the tool, we need to have it open. So usually, I'll just open it, leave it in the background, and forget about it. What this does is it enables us to interpolate between slices. So if we trace on slice one, skip a number of slices, and then trace, we can fill in in between automatically without actually needing to manually trace all those slices. So here, I'll just start tracing out this mitochondrion, again, using that join tool. Okay, now I'll page up, page down, say five slices and redo it, just tracking it across those slices to make sure it's the same one. OK. So now I've traced it on four slices. Um, we can look at the three-dimensional view of those contours by going to the model view, which is under um, image model view. Again, hot keyed to the V key. So here, this is a three-dimensional view of those contours. If I right-click and drag, I can rotate it in three dimensions. So there are the contours I've drawn. You can see the sections have been skipped in between. If I now select the contour, and it can be any contour, it doesn't matter if it's the top or bottom one, and hit Enter, it'll fill in those interpolations in between those contours I've drawn. So as I page up and page down through, you see it's done a pretty good job of predicting those contours. What I can do now is those dashed contours, which are the predictions of the interpolator, are um, kind of stored separately from the solid contours that I've actually drawn, in the sense that they can be deleted. So if I here click and clear all interpolations and click yes, it'll get rid of just those dashed ones and not the ones that I've actually drawn and committed to solid contours. 
So I'll regenerate. So that can be a quick way to get rid of things that you don't want. If the interpolator got some contours that are bad, um, you can just bulk delete them without deleting the things that you don't want it to. So what we do after this is then go through and check that each contour is about what we want. And by right-clicking and hitting Enter on it, it commits it to a solid contour that can't, can no longer then be deleted using that sort of batch processing. So here I can just go through really quickly, because they're all pretty good. And commit them all. So there's a bad one, right? So that's typically at the bottom. So this is the reason this is not a good interpolation is because there's no more data on the bottom. So it doesn't have anything to guide it in that direction. So here I can delete that, and it keeps everything I wanted. Or I could have I could have warped it, yeah. And and if you want really precise results, you can go back and of course warp all of these. So for example, here it, it kind of missed a little bit, so I can warp that back to the to the membrane. Um, so that's the basic use of the interpolator. Again, I didn't really have to click anything in this menu. Um, I just opened it and forgot about it. Um, within 3D mod, just one last thing before break is meshing. So meshing is what's going to really get us the quantitative, the ability to perform some sort of quantitative analysis. It can be done through the command line, which we'll learn to do in um, this afternoon's module. You can also do it through the 3D mod model view window here using edit objects. Again, similar to just the uh, zap window. We can change things like color, line size, etc., using these here. And there's also a meshing option at the bottom. Um, skip, just to give a brief outline of what everything's doing, skip. And setting this number here will mesh across missing slices. So if we go back to that initial case where we hadn't used the interpolator and we had traced it every five slices, it would fill in a mesh with that missing data if we set it to five. So it would um, make some sort of mesh across those missing slices. It wouldn't necessarily be the most accurate mesh because it doesn't have those contours there guiding it, but it would give you something. Um, so for now, we're going to uncheck that since we have it on every slice and we don't need it. Um, low res will make a low resolution mesh. Um, not really ever necessary. Uh, cap, which I'll, I'll show capped and uncapped mesh. Cap will just... Uh, make a mesh across the top and bottom of the traces. Um, so let's just go ahead and mesh and see what it, we get. So here is our three-dimensional model of that mitochondrion, or at least that section of it that I traced. I didn't trace the whole thing. You can see the top and bottom that, that were open are now meshed across because we clicked that cap option. If we uncheck it and click mesh, you see now it's open. And that's really more of a faithful representation of what we have since we didn't actually finish tracing the whole model for sake of time. Um, and in the second module, we'll get more into the meshing and how, what, how to use these for doing quantitative analyses. Um, so that is it for my 30-minute iMod crash course. Um, any questions before we break? We'll be doing this hands-on over the next hour, so there will also be time for uh, Chris and I to answer questions during that time. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, good question. So um, I think at the bottom it ended. So here we see this, if I, it just kind of disappears there, right? So if I just kept tracing here, here, yeah, you're just you're basically just tracing the structure until it disappears. Maybe this will be the last slice I trace it on. Something like that. And then when it's it's gone and you don't see it anymore, then you just stop. And if we look at that in 3D, um, putting the contours back on. So we're going to switch from mesh to contour. So you see it's kind of come through to an end here. And now we can, if we mesh it again, uh, you'll see it. If we, had, if we had continued in the, the upwards direction too, we'd have the full structure traced from end to end. 
Um, so that's all you do to finish it. You don't need to do anything special. There's no special thing you need to put at the end of it. It just knows that that's the end of, of that object. Yeah. OK, so I guess we had a 10-minute break scheduled, right? Um, so in the next okay, our coffee break for 10.43. Yeah, so we'll, we'll take 10 minutes. And in the next session, we'll be going, we'll, we'll get everyone, in, uh, IMOD installed on everyone's laptops and download the first data set and, uh, and walk through the, the demo instructions with everyone. Okay.